Dr. Mulligan will give us another 30,000 foot view of uh, what a, you know, what this history of emergency medicine is in the United States. Um, this is America's safety net, victims of our own success, a brief history of emergency medicine. Okay, hello. Um, I'm gonna try to switch over to my um, lecture. Can you see my slides there? Yep. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you everybody for uh, the introduction and for your participation today. I think uh, it's been an exciting morning so far. And I'm really happy to talk to you right after lunch about um, a brief history of emergency medicine and how we've become victims of our own success. I don't have any financial disclosures to make. This is my email and my Twitter handle. It's T Mulligan with three L's, T Mulligan. And I wanna start with a, one of my favorite uh, statements from one of the grandfathers of emergency medicine, Dr. Louis Goldfrank, who once said, every patient who presents to the emergency department represents a failure of the public health system. And what this means is that we see people who have fallen through the cracks of the healthcare system. And more and more, especially over the last 18 months, we're realizing we're seeing people who've fallen through the cracks of society, not just the healthcare system. And that's what we are there for. We're there for that. How is it that we got here? Um, many, many years ago, there was no specific emergency medicine training. Uh, most emergency departments um, in the country, and this is in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even into the 1970s, were staffed by doctors who had credentialing at that hospital, uh, but who weren't trained in emergency medicine. Maybe they were trained in some other specialty. Maybe they were GPs. Maybe they were people who were moonlighters. In some cases, they were the you know, problematic doctors, people who had uh, trouble getting um, uh, credentials at other places. They often worked in the emergency department. And then um, over the course of the 60s and 70s, as was gone over by Dr. McNamara this morning, emergency medicine training was eventually established. The first resident, the first uh, society, ASEP, was formed in 1968 and had its first conference in 1969. The first residency was in 1970. Um, the AOBEM and the ABEM were formed in 1976 and 1977. Emergency medicine was recognized as a specialty underneath surgery in 79. ABEM had its first board exam in 1980. Um, and ACGME uh, recognized emergency medicine in 1982. And it wasn't until 1989, uh, more than 20 years after the first um, uh, specialty society was formed in the USA, that emergency medicine was its own standalone specialty. So this is not ancient history. We went from no training to the present day in about 52, 53 years. Um, the, the UK is uh, one country that is very close behind us starting in 1968 as well. Um, and which means almost every other country that has emergency medicine is younger than that. And so as far as medical specialties go, this is not old. 50 years is not an old history. We heard a lot of the uh, uh, detailed history from Dr. Ma uh, McNamara this morning. So I won't go into the details of how we got here. But one of the things that we have achieved is this concept of we are there for anyone, anything, anytime. And we use this as a way to establish ourselves. We use this as, a, as an endpoint for our training to be able to handle emergencies of any type of any kind. We can handle the uh, emergencies for young people, old people, for men, for women, for children, for uh, elderly, and across the, uh, the, the gamut of specialties. Unfortunately, one of the things that has happened is we've gone from treating anyone, anything, anytime to treating everyone, everything, all the time. And that's one of the slippery slopes that we have gone down. And hopefully we haven't fallen off of uh, that slope uh, so far, but we're very close to. So where are we now? 
we always want to know where we are. We are in the middle of our evolution. Uh, we've gone past the hard stages. We've gone past the middle stages. We are now are in one of the existential stages. Are we going to continue to exist in the way that we have for the last 20, 30 years as a full specialty and 50 years as a, as a, uh, a concept? So what has happened around the world is every single hospital, whether it's a brand new modern hospital in a modern rich country, or whether it's just a building out in the middle of nowhere in a lower middle income country, uh, these buildings have front doors. And what happens when you open the front door is that patients start to come and they come and they come and they come. And even in the US where we have a pretty good EMS system, most people don't come by ambulance. Um, we only have about 20 or 30 percent of our people come by ambulance. In most countries, it's less than that. So what happens when they come? They come and the ER gets fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller. And we see more and more patients. What happens over time is that the emergency department gets more and more full. As medicine has progressed and as our technology has increased, we are doing more and more and more in the ER. We go up five, six, seven percent footfalls per year, but the hospital is not going up five, six, seven percent beds per year. We don't get five or six or seven percent more ICU beds or OR beds or faculty. In fact, it's the opposite. So what has happened is more and more is being done in the ER, less and less is being done in the hospital, and we are we are being filled and packed to the gills. Here's a picture of the emergency department. We have the front door and the back door of the emergency department. As soon as you open the front door, you have this flowing river of patients that always comes in. And once you open the front door, you cannot close the front door. You can close the front door to the operating room or to the ICU or to the ward, but you can't close the front door to the, the ER. What happens inside this um, flowing river of, of patients is we do all of our doctor stuff somewhere in the middle. Uh, we do our tests, our examinations, CAT scans, uh, EKGs, et cetera, and we make a disposition. But often what we notice is that the back door of this ER is closed, either fully closed or partially closed because the hospital is full. And we see the ER getting bigger and bigger and bigger and fuller and fuller and fuller. We used to call this overcrowding. And then someone said, well, let's not call it overcrowding because that implies that crowding is okay. And then our colleagues in the UK and Australia stopped calling it crowding and started calling it for what it is, started calling it access block and care block because this back door of the hospital being closed is blocking these patients from being cared for, causing the backup. So the backup is in the ER, but the ER is not the cause of the backup. So it's like someone stepping on a hose and the hose gets bigger and bigger and bigger and swells and swells and swells. So what happens to the patients in the ER? We see people who are sick who need to be admitted, people who we can tr treat and dis, uh, disposition, some people who come in for uh, uh, emergency care, some people who come in for primary care, but they can't be admitted. Sometimes they're admitted, but they're sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, but they can't go upstairs because there are no beds. And so who takes care of them? We are. So we don't have a 45 bed ER or a 50 bed ER. We have a 35 bed ER because 10 or 20 of our patients are already admitted and we are taking care of them. So this flowing river of patients who come in, they walk in our front door. It's kind of like these marathons uh, where they throw the colored uh, powder on you. When they walk in the front door, we throw this invisible powder on them, which is value. We are imbuing them and anointing them with the value of the emergency department. That value lies in early stabilization, early recognition, early treatment, early disposition, early admission, early transfer, or timely um, discharge, an appropriate discharge. This is this invisible value that we imbue on all of our patients as they come through the ER. But what happens, these patients come into the ER, we do things to them, and they go back the, uh, out the back door of the ER and they get separated in through this spaghetti strainer into 300 different streams where they go to this ward or that ward or this ER or, OR or this ICU or this family practice doctor. And all that value that we have imbued on them gets separated and diluted. And we're, it's often not recognized, not measured, and we don't get thanked for it. 
or recognize for it, we don't get the Christmas cards or the thank you cards uh, the other doctors do. So what are the real benefits and value of emergency medicine if you put it into numbers? Uh, over and over, we are seeing that emergency department is one of the key engines of the health hospital and the healthcare system. We're seeing over the last decades, uh, ER visits are going up and up and up. And this is even before the COVID days, uh, more and more people are going to the ER. Uh, and that trend is in almost every age category. We're seeing that uh, these trends have, um, all, not only have they gone up, but they've gone down in other parts of the hospital and healthcare system. And what we see uh, is that about 150 or 151 million patient visits per year visit our emergency departments. That's more than half the country coming through the emergency department per year. Now that's not, some people come zero times and some people come five times, but on average it's 150 million patients per year. And that goes up by four, five, 6% every year. A study that was done through the University of Maryland showed that nearly half of all medical care in hospitals in the US is in the emergency department. This means that 51% of all, all care delivered in hospitals is in the emergency department. We're delivering 51% of all hospital care. That's insane, that's an, a large number. One department is responsible, one division of medicine is responsible for half of the hospital care. And uh, we're doing it better and better and better. 61% of all hospital admissions come through the emergency department. And we know that the majority of hospital, their major income comes from their admissions. And so if they uh, have 80 or 90% of their income coming from admissions and one department is giving them 61% of their admissions, they should be paying attention to what's happening in the ER. This is why what we are doing is so valuable. It's uh, just many, many more studies showing that what we're doing to our patients in our ERs, uh, saving some of their lives, helping most of them, and giving early recognition, early stabilization, early diagnosis to almost everybody, this is extremely valuable. This is why we're such easy prey for people looking to cash in on value. So this value is what makes us easy targets. So what we've learned by looking at the trends and looking at the numbers is that the emergency department is actually the engine of the hospital. It's the economic engine, the admissions engine, the stabilization engine. It's the patient safety engine. It's the patient satisfaction engine. If you shut the door to the ER, the hospital closes. It's critical to the public health system. It's the safety net for the hospital, the safety net for the other specialists, the safety net for people who have nowhere to go. It's the safety net for the cracks in the healthcare system, but also the safety net for the cracks in society. How do we communicate this, these benefits and values? Well, I used to give a lecture that I would say, let's propose a day without the ER. Let's imagine that one day, some average Tuesday, you have the emergency departments all across the country, every ER across the country just shuts the door for one day. This is a thought experiment, mm -hmm. not a threat, not a suggestion. But imagine if you had all the ERs closed just for one day, what would be the impact of that? You can ask these questions. It's about 5,200 emergency departments, 150 million patient visits. You can do the math on the back of an envelope. It's about 400,000 patients per day. Let's say 1% of them die. That's 4,000 deaths a day. How many people will be permanently disabled? I don't know, 5%, 10%? How many will be inappropriately diagnosed, misdiagnosed, delayed diagnosed, wrong diagnosis? Another 10, 20, 30%? How many will have no follow-up or inappropriate follow-up? Take your pick. So this is a good way to show what would the impact of the uh, uh, closing the ER for one day? How many people will die? One to 2%? That's about 4,000 deaths a day. And remember, I gave this lecture the first time in, in 2017, 2018, 2019, that's one and a half World Trade Centers per day. That's the same thing as 10 or 20 jumbo jet crashes per day. So if you saw 10 or 20 jumbo 
Jet. Do you think you would uh, have any importance on that? Well, unfortunately, 2020 and 2021 have shown us that we actually started seeing that happen. We were seeing unbelievable increase amount of deaths, most of which were preventable. And now we're back up in the thousands of deaths per day. We're seeing one 9-11 happen per day uh, because of this COVID. And uh, we're seeing images like this reminding us, now we kind of know what would it look like if the ER was shut just for one day all across the country. So I, I wanna ask yourself, is this safe? Does this look like what they're doing is a smart thing to do? I don't know what these guys are doing in this picture, but they should stop doing it. They're doing it wrong. Some things you can just look at the way they're doing it and it's, you can tell that it's not being done right. That's where we are in healthcare and in the emergency department right now. And it's not because of us. So what, one of the things that the uh, pandemic has uh, uh, done has ripped aside the curtain on what we do. And it's shown uh, to not just us, but the outside world, what the healthcare system really uses the emergency department for. It uses us as this safety net, which I mentioned. It uses us as the, this cleanup crew, the cleanup crew that comes in after the healthcare system cruises through and uh, takes what it wants to take. What's left behind is what we have to take care of. The hospital uses the emergency as a big overflow pressure valve. So instead of having an overflowing, um, boiling hospital, it pushes it all down into the ER and has an overflowing, boiling ER. And what usually happens, we are at or over capacity, even in pre-COVID day, 35% of the time. Now we're at or over capacity 50 to 60% of the time. The, the OR is never over capacity. The ICU is almost never over capacity. The ER is more than half the time over capacity. What is it that we're asked to do? A little bit of everything. And this is the training that we designed. This is the training that we like. This is the job we like. But what is it we're really doing? We're being asked to do more and more and more and more. And what does it look like when people come down into the ER? It looks like chaos. It looks like uh, overworked, under-trained, under-staffed, under-equipped, and we're being asked to do more and more and more. What is it that the hospitalists are doing and the admitting doctors? Well, because of the perverse incentives of limiting uh, insurance company reimbursement and new protocols that come out, limiting admissions every uh, two or three months, the hospitalists and other doctors are often acting as goalies trying to prevent the admissions that we are trying to support. Insurance companies wind up acting as uh, mostly unnecessary middlemen. We've heard about how, how private equity and contract management groups are squeezing out the extra, squeezing out um, the profit by uh, limiting medical care and reducing quality, and even now uh, getting rid of physicians. What hospital groups are doing again, taking money from one pocket and putting it into the other pocket, not providing any major improvements on medical care. And then the private equity groups uh, that are backing these um, contract management groups and the hospital groups are laughing all the way to the bank. What is it left, uh, uh, what, what does it leave for us to do? To take care of our patients with one hand or two hands tied behind our back with one foot nailed to the floor, not enough PPE, not enough uh, uh, medical equipment, not enough staffing. Now we're uh, under the threat of being replaced by NPs and PAs. And what is it we're doing? We're being exhausted. Uh, we're getting emotionally drained. We're getting overworked and we're being left behind. Again, does this sound safe to you? Does this situation look safe to you? My mom can look at this picture and say, this doesn't sound safe. So our our healthcare system for decades has been running in the red, running at 9,000 RPMs, almost ready to crash, almost ready to break under its own pressure. We heard earlier today um, how medicine is a house divided, that we have the business interests and business incentives on one side at odds and clashing with the clinical and medical interests and how that is causing most of the problems. We have perverse incentives 
fighting each other. So it's, uh, we have this strange relationship of physicians who took an oath to treat their patients, forming relationships with businessmen who took an oath to maximize profits. And what is it that usually wins? The profits usually win. So huge profits to be made by sacrificing quality and safety. We know there's a heck of a lot of money to be made in medicine if you don't care about doing things the wrong way. So we're seeing this picture here. This is the picture of every emergency patient right here. This is our patient who's coming into the emergency department expecting and deserving the best, highest quality emergency care. But what is it that they're actually getting? Their care is being pulled in four different directions by the medical insurance companies, by the hospital group's interests, by pharmaceutical companies and device companies, and by private equity and contract management groups. And the patient's care is more affected by these perverse incentives than it is by the medicine and the science that we can deliver. They don't know this walking in. We know this walking in, but we don't, we as physicians have almost no total control over any of these directions. We've heard a little bit about burnout, about how emergency medicine is at the top of the burnout scale, but we have to think about the words that we use. The same way we shouldn't be calling it overcrowding or crowding, and instead we should call it uh, access block. We should stop calling burnout, burnout, because the words we use affect how we think. We all know the quote, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. But we know that in reality, that's not true. What's in a name, a rose by any other name would wither and die. What we call things affects the way we think about them. What we're calling burnout, we should stop calling burnout. We have to flip the narrative on so-called burnout. You're not suffering from a lack of deep breathing or mind-body control or work-life imbalance. You're not suffering from yoga penia. You're not burning out. You're being abused. You're being taken advantage of. The patients are being taken advantage of. There, I agree, there is an arms race between these different uh, entities, uh, pharma, medical insurance, different companies, all competing after the same healthcare dollar. What's responsible for creating and sustaining this abusive relationship? Like a lot of abusive relationships, they're very hard to recognize when you're in the middle of them. They're very hard to get out of. They're very hard to extricate yourself from. Who's responsible for this? It's the rise of the corporate practice of medicine. It's the perverse incentives of uh, uh, medicine for profit and quality is secondary or tertiary or not even in the mix. We have the growth of physicians and administrators and it leads us to this uh, very uh, prescient quote. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Meaning we don't, recognize the problem because so many people are getting rich from it. Again, the fox guarding the hen house is not a good way to run medicine. Remember this uh, flowing river of patients who are coming into the ER? Well, way upstream on that same river is a um, corporate practice of medicine that is muddying the water, polluting the water, and we are removing and treating their pollution. And by, uh, by our doing more and more and better, better job at what we do, we are actually encouraging their bad behavior. If we keep doing more and more and more, which we are, and our practice has gotten 700% more efficient since the 1970s, by doing our job better and better and better, we are actually enabling the bad actors to continue to act badly. We saw all the negative effects on our practice of the corporatization of, emer of emergency medicine and medicine in general, decreases quality of care, decreases productivity, decreases job satisfaction, increases abuse and burnout. And it's all from having these perverse incentives. We as physicians know that doing the right thing is always the right thing. And this is what we want to do, but we are not being allowed to do it. We're afraid to speak up. We're afraid to change jobs. We're afraid to uh, put ourselves out into the pasture where we are uh, having to struggle with 200, 300, $400,000 in debt. 
So where do we go from here? Well, the pandemic this last year has shown us some things that we have seen before and we have been pounding the table trying to get the world to recognize, but now maybe other parts of the world are recognizing this, that this pandemic is, is showing what a struggling system has been there for the last 20 years. Uh, we've had unbelievable amount of success with the way that physicians and nurses and healthcare practitioners uh, are behaving and sacrificing, putting themselves at risk, their families at risk, taking care of patients the way we were trained to, and going above and beyond and then some. And the pandemic has uh, allowed the curtain to be pulled aside a little bit to show what's really behind this curtain. And what it's showing is that we're relying too much on our physicians. We're relying too much on healthcare practitioners because we've taken an oath and because we are obsessed with taking care of patients. The system knows that it can keep squeezing us and squeezing us and squeezing us. We hear in the ER have this, we, Art Kellerman called the emergency department, a room with a view where we can see back in time at the, all the holes and cracks in the healthcare system that cause patients to have to come to the ER. And we can see forward in time and all the road bumps and obstacles, uh, speed bumps and obstacles that, are, uh, that uh, await the patient as we discharge them from the ER. We know that the ER sits in the middle of this web of patients and that the ERs and trauma systems connected to each other and the hospital systems and the ERs connected to each other form this web of readiness, this lattice of preparedness that is there for any and all emergencies, but it is not invincible. The ER system is like a mangrove swamp on the coastlines in New Orleans and along our coastlines. Uh, very small trees, but when connected, uh, net, uh, their network of roots and uh, their network provides a, a way for the storm to exhaust itself. The storm or the hurricane will beat itself to death on these mangroves. You take the mangroves away and the hurricane will come 50 miles inland and destroy cities. This is very much like the emergency system and the uh, trauma system. That when we have a, a horrible pandemic or an emergency, or whether we have everyday emergencies, what this lattice does is, is it absorbs the impact. If you want a good disaster system or pandemic system, build a good everyday emergency system. For these and many other reasons, the emergency medicine and acute care systems are in a global crisis. And this was true even before COVID. COVID is allowing us to see behind the scenes and is highlighting and spotlighting the emergency department. When was the last time you saw emergency doctors on the television two or three times a day? We have to take advantage of this goodwill, of this temporary recognition of what we are doing for the healthcare system and leverage it into some real and lasting change. COVID-19 could bring a new era of public health leadership, but will it? COVID is like the 9-11 for the healthcare system. Just like 9-11, there was a before time and an after time. And just like 9-11, there were things that happened afterwards that were good. There were things that major things that happened afterwards that were bad. And I think we'll look back on COVID and see the same thing. In three, four, five years from now, we'll look back and hopefully we'll see some major public real change that was, has been made to the healthcare system because of what COVID has exposed. Remember, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Remember, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing more than medicine on a grand scale. And remember, the past is never dead. It's not even past. That's my talk. This is my email and my Twitter handle. I'm, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, I look forward to, to uh, staying in this conference for the next uh, two days and, and talking with you after. Thank you again. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> um, always very insightful and, uh, you know, giving great perspective on, on what this really means on a, on a large scale. Uh, I said 30,000 feet. I guess we can go up to 50 or 75,000 in, in your view. 